Good morning. It's good to be here. Thank you for your presence here this morning. I'm encouraged that you're here, and I know that others are as well. And let us take a moment to thank God that we are here, that we are able to be together on this first day of the week to worship Him, to edify one another. It is truly a privilege to be here. And I hope that you are thankful. I hope that God has been glorified today by what we have done. If you would go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We'll start there this morning. Last week I kind of gave a a little bit of a teaser for this sermon and for uh, this month's topic. We're going to be talking about forging new bonds, so to speak, as we talked about last month, how we can uh, keep the bond of peace, how we can keep the unity. Uh, But we talked about how, yes, we can uh, keep the bonds that we have now and strengthen those. Yes, we can uh, repair our, our damage bonds, that is, resolve conflicts with one another. And yes, we can seek those who have walked away, restore those discarded bonds. But we can also forge new bonds in that we can bring those who are lost, bring those who have never been to Christ, who do not know about Christ, we can bring them to Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today and for the rest of this month as well. There are various ways that you can say that. You can say that you are seeking the lost. You can say that you are preaching the gospel But what I landed on is the idea of winning souls. And that is a scriptural phrase, win souls. Although um, the the verse that mentions winning souls, I'm not sure if it's talking specifically about evangelism because it is an Old Testament passage. However, Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 does talk about winning people to Christ. He never says win souls, but he talks about that idea of winning people to Christ. And so that's what I landed on. We're going to talk about winning souls today and for the rest of the month. And Luke chapter 19 helps set that that up for us. Luke chapter 19, we'll start in verse 1 and get the full context. Luke chapter 19 starting in verse 1. It says, He, that is Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble and say, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus seizes upon this opportunity where Zacchaeus is seeking him. But Jesus says, No, I'm seeking you, Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house. I'm staying at your house. And when these people grumble because he's staying in the house of the sinner, Jesus essentially says, yes, that's the point. Salvation has come to his house. And we see Zacchaeus show signs of repentance, show signs of a heart that is willing to accept the kingdom of God, to come to Jesus. Jesus says, yes, today salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is, that's the reason that Jesus came to earth. 
That's the reason He came. He wants to find those who are lost and bring them to Him. Bring them into the kingdom. And Zacchaeus was such a one. But if that is Jesus' purpose, if that's why Jesus came to this earth, to seek and to save that which was lost, to die on the cross for our sins, to save us, so that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have an eternal life. Then we must ask ourselves, as as Jesus' disciples, what should our concern be? Well, Jesus can answer that too. In Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, In verse 17, Jesus is calling His disciples for the first time. In verse 17 of Mark chapter 1, And Jesus said to them, that is Simon and Andrew, the fishermen, He says, Follow Me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Peter and Andrew, they were fishers of the sea. They were fishers of fish, right? But Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They were going to cast out their nets into the world and draw men to Jesus. But it wasn't just the apostles who were told to be fishers of men. They were the first. But over in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Jesus says to His disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said to His his disciples, Go and make disciples. And if Jesus told His disciples, Back in Mark chapter 1, the reason that He's calling them to be disciples is to be fishers of men. We should understand disciples are fishers of men. But even more explicitly than that, in verse 20, it says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. He's just commanded them to go and make disciples. We understand that when we become disciples... This command applies to us as well. We are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So as Jesus' concern is to come and seek and save the lost, we as His disciples, our our concern is to seek and save the lost. We need to be concerned about winning souls. So let's talk about how. How do we win souls to Jesus, how do we seek and save the lost? Number one, we win souls by our example. Over in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus says, we're salt. We're light. A salt is meant to bring flavor. It's meant to make something distinct. And meant to make something appealing, so to speak. But if you put, if you put salt on and it's not salty, it's lost its flavor, what good is putting salt on something? You're just putting grains of basically dirt, you know? What good is a light? 
if you, as Jesus uses the analogy here, if you light a lamp and then put it under a basket, does that light have any good? In the same way, our example, our light is to be shining. We are to preserve ourselves to make distinction, to make appeal. Not for ourselves, not to draw them unto ourselves, but rather that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about this. Philippians chapter 2. In verse 14. Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain, nor toil in vain. And Peter says something similar over in 1 Peter chapter uh, 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. <clears throat> Let me say this. Our conduct is always going to point to something. Our conduct is always going to point to something. It may point to God, and it should point to God, but oftentimes our conduct points to self. Or our conduct points to some other priority. Some other master. And both Peter and Paul talk about how we are in the midst of of a crooked and perverse generation, that we're uh, among the Gentiles, among the world. And that our behavior has to be excellent. It has to be distinct. It has to be not like the rest of them. If we don't prove ourselves different from the world, then we've watered down the gospel. Because the whole point of the gospel is to seek and save that which is lost. It is to change us. It is to transform us. It is meant to make us not like the rest of the world, but rather different. To make us <coughs> holy, to make us righteous. That's what the purpose of the gospel is. But if we are not different, if our lights are not shining, then how are they going to see the true light? If our conduct is not pointing to Jesus and showing the transformation in our lives, then we have watered down the gospel. Because somebody who sees that we profess the gospel, but they don't see the change that it's supposed to produce, they're going to conclude that the gospel is false. Or that the gospel is not what we say it is. But on the other hand, if we are in our conduct different from the world, we keep our behavior excellent among the Gentiles. If we are true examples, true lights, true salt, 
then they will see our behavior and they will glorify God. Even people who are lost, they can see Jesus, they can see God in us. And they will notice that we are different. They will notice that the gospel has transformed us. And some will hate us for it. Some will be jealous. Some will persecute us, yes. But others will also see that and want to find that too. They will want to find that treasure that we have found. Let's make sure that by our example, our conduct is pointing to God. We win souls by our example, by our conduct, but we also win souls by our words. By invitation. Over in the book of John, if we want to learn how to seek and save the lost, we need to follow Jesus. No different than the rest of our conduct. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. Jesus is called the master teacher. He is a shepherd, the good shepherd. So if we want to learn how to win souls, why not look at Jesus? In John 1 and verse 35, it says, Again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus and looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is called Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Here Jesus is asked a very simple question by two disciples of John. And John has given the invitation of sorts. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. So they start following Jesus and they ask where He's staying. They want to know where He's staying so that they can follow Him, interact with Him, be with Him. They ask this simple question, Rabbi or teacher, where are you staying? Jesus says, Come and see. A very simple invitation, but a very effective one. Perhaps somebody's intrigued by the life you live. They're intrigued by your example. They see that you are different. They see the gospel has transformed you. They may say to you, where do you go to church? Or they may say something like, how do I get that for myself? A very simple invitation is, come and see. Come and see. And that doesn't necessarily mean invite them to the church, although it certainly includes that. <clears throat> but just invite them. Come and see. Invite them to church. Invite them to study with you. Ultimately, invite them into the Word so that they can see Jesus for who He is. But understand that with our invitation, we also need to know who's invited. And Jesus tells us that too. Over in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus issues an invitation. He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Who's invited? Well, a simple answer is everyone. Those who are lost need to come to Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus, but Jesus puts it a different way here. He says, all who are weary and heavy laden. Who do you know in your life who's not tired? Who's not worn down by the world? Who doesn't look out at the world, look out at the chaos and say, you know, this just isn't right. Every single person I talk to, whether they're Christian or not, they will tell you, this world's messed up. I don't think I've talked to a single person who says, I'm happy with where, where the world is right now. I'm happy with where, I, where my life is right now. Not a single person outside of the, the church has said those, those words, that I'm happy with where my life is at right now. Everyone is weary. Everyone is heavy laden. Everyone is worn down by the world and how imperfect, chaotic, and sinful it is. Some people aren't willing to admit that to themselves. Some people may look at some things in the world and, and give their approval to them and act like it's no big deal and celebrate the wicked things that are going on. Yes. But someone who is honest, somebody who is truthful, they're going to see that they're tired. They're heavy laden. And that they something's got to give. And that they need Jesus. And Jesus, to those people, He says, come to Me. Come to Jesus. He's going to give you rest. We need to be aware of that invitation and we need to be spreading that invitation. Because it's not just Jesus who invites. If you turn over to Revelation 22, Jesus invited people. He said, come and see. Of course, we didn't read in John right after that that Philip uses the same language to invite Nathaniel or most likely Bartholomew. He says, come and see to him. But look in Revelation 22. Revelation 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star, the spirit and the bride say come and let the one who hears say come and let the one who is thirsty come let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost Jesus has sent out his invitation but the spirit is inviting the spirit invites and says come we recognize that the Spirit, a lot of His work is through the Holy Scriptures. The Holy Scriptures invite and say, come. But it also says, the bride says, come. Who is the bride? The bride of Christ. That is the church. That is those who have been saved. They say, come. But not just that. Let the one who hears say, come. They've heard the invitation but they need to invite others as well. If we consider ourselves to be part of Christ's church, to be part of Christ's bride, then we need to be inviting too. And we can get so bogged down with how am I going to do that? What am I going to say? We don't realize that 
really what we just need to say is come and see. Come and see. We need to be, as Jesus was, inviting. Because everybody is invited. Everyone needs that invitation. Let's be the ones to issue it. We also win souls by urgency. By our urgency. The first two kind of deal with how. They, they deal with the method. But this last one, it deals with our attitude. It deals with the why we're doing this. But understand, if we don't have the attitude that we need, it's not going to get done. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. I've said this before, I'll say it again. God wants everyone to be saved. He's not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's what God wants. But the question is, do we share the same attitude? Truly, do we have the heart of God not, willing, not wishing for anyone to perish? I'll give you an example of this over in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Verse 1. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Notice what Paul says here. He says, I am, the tell I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. He spends a whole verse saying, I'm not, what I'm about to say is the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I'm not lying. It says in verse 2, that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Why? Verse 3, For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He goes on to talk about how that's Israel. He's talking about the Jews. And specifically in chapters 9 through 11 of Romans, he's talking about how the Jews have rejected Jesus and many of them have been rejected because of that. They've been cut off from the blessings of Israel. They've been cut off from Christ. And Paul says, if I could be separated from Christ so that they would be saved, that's what I would do. Now that's strong language. That's hard language, difficult language. But the point is, is that he is so torn up. He has unceasing grief in his heart for people who are lost. And that's part of why he does what he does. It's because he recognizes that they are separated from Christ. They are accursed. They are lost, truly. And Paul had the attitude that we should have as well. When we think of people who are in the world, people who do not have Christ, we should also be grieved. We should have great sorrow and unceasing grief in our hearts for them. Paul in Colossians 4 shows more of this kind of attitude. 
In Colossians 4 and verse 2, Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open us up to us, a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So the question is, do we share the same attitude of Paul that we are grieved in our hearts thinking about all the people in the world who are lost? Another thing we should ask is, do we pray for doors to be opened? Do we pray regularly that we can find ways to seek and save the lost, to win souls? The reason I say urgency, it is an urgent matter. We talked this morning in Bible class. We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. We don't know how long anybody has on this earth. They could be here today and have a tragic accident and be gone tomorrow. Or a heart attack or a stroke or so many other things could happen. Even if Jesus doesn't come back, they might not have another day. And yet they're lost. And if we are not honest with ourselves about that, if we are not scripturally, spiritually minded about that, then we're not going to have the attitude needed to win souls. And here's what I mean by that. Think about your friends. Think about your family members. Think about anyone you love. Understand some of them are Christians. They're living the right kind of life. But also know that there are those who have never come to Christ. They have not obeyed the gospel. What are they? They are lost. They are in danger of hellfire. Don't just think about your friends. Don't just think about your family, your loved ones. I recognize that hits closer to home. But think about the person who checks you out at Walmart. Think about the person that you come across going to the doctor. Think about your doctor or your nurses. Think about the person that you do business with. Think about the person that you just see passing on the street. As you're driving, think about all the different people in the cars. Obviously, you don't know the situation of every single one of them. Some of them may be Christians. But a lot of them are not. A lot of them have not come to Christ. They are lost. And I'm not saying that from a sanctimonious, judgmental point of view, where I'm higher than them. No, I recognize that that was me too once. But sometimes we like to be wishy-washy on the truth. Sometimes we look at somebody who might be going, going to, to church in another place where they don't teach and practice the truth. Sometimes we might let, want to, to look at somebody on the street who we don't know their circumstances. And we might say, well, you know what? I don't know their heart. God knows their heart. Therefore, I don't know that they're lost. I can't pass that judgment. What have I done there? I've taken away that urgency. I've taken away that feeling of I need to say something. I need to do something to help them. I've taken away my responsibility. I've helped myself feel better. But how I feel, myself feeling better, is not going to save them. Good feelings are not going to save us. Jesus is. 
And if they are not in Christ, we need to feel that urgency. We need to feel, you know what, this may be my only chance. I need to say something, anything. I need to try to open up a door. And I'll admit, I'm not good at that. I'll admit, there are times where I lack this sense of urgency in my own life. I get carried away with the things of the day. I'll say, you know what, I'll mention that some other time. This is not the right time for that. I don't know that I have another chance. I've I've brought up this quote from the pulpit before, but I think it's a very powerful quote. The man who said it is a a man by the name of Penn Jillette, and he is uh, a magician by trade. He's part of a, uh, a very famous duo of magicians called Penn and Teller. But he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. But notice what he says here. And in this quote that I'm about to read, I am going to uh, replace one word. He says proselytize, but there I'm going to use preach the gospel. Just so that it can hit home a little bit further. This is what he said. He said, I've always said that I don't respect people who don't preach the gospel. I don't respect that at all. If you believe there's a heaven and a hell, and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, or atheists who think people shouldn't preach the gospel, And who say, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself. How much do you have to hate somebody to not preach the gospel? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? Again, this guy's atheist. He he doesn't believe in God. But he recognizes that if it's true what we're saying, if it's true... That there is an eternal fate on the line that we can be eternally lost in hell. Or even if you don't believe in hell, if you think somebody could miss out on eternal life. And you're not telling them. He, He says, not I, but he says, how much do you have to hate somebody? I mean, that's strong language. Not just that you don't care about them, but you hate them. He would go on in the quote to use this analogy that, you know, if somebody is standing in the middle of the road and a truck is bearing down on them. And I see that they may not see that, but I I see that and I don't do something about that. If I don't go and push them out of the way, even. Where's my decency? Where's my love? We have to understand that a lot of people are standing in the middle of the road. And that certain doom, that certain death is coming straight for them. And a lot of them don't see it. And yes, truthfully, a lot of people don't want to see it. They can be shown it. And they're going to still, because of of their convenience, because it... It requires changing their lives. They're going to say, no, that truck's not coming for me. They will willingly turn a blind eye to it. Yes, I understand that happens. But if we're not pointing that out to them, if we don't have the urgency to save their lives, to save their souls, we're not going to be effective. We don't have that urgency, then we don't have the heart and mind of God. That's the truth of it. If we truly believe someone is lost and we truly love people like God loves people, then we're going to have that urgency in our lives. The urgency to tell people about Jesus. As we close this morning,
And we're going to be talking about these topics throughout the month. Next week, we'll be talking about our example. The week after that, we'll be talking about bringing the invitation. Not the week after that. The week after that, we have the gospel meeting. But then the next two Sundays, we'll be talking about giving an invitation, inviting people to Jesus. And we're also going to talk about urgency. But also tonight, we're going to have a singing night. And the theme of the singing night is seeking the lost. We're going to read scriptures about it. We're going to sing about it. We're going to pray about it. We need to have this focus. Not just this month, but every month, every day, every hour. We need to have that urgency to bring Jesus, the people to Jesus. This morning, maybe you've heard what I've had to say and you re- realize that you are lost. I don't know the hearts of everyone in here and I don't know the circumstances of everyone in here. But you know your own heart. You know what you have done and what you have not done. If you have not given yourself to Christ by hearing the gospel, by believing in Jesus by repenting of your sins, by confessing Jesus' name before men, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, you are still lost in your sins. You have not put on Christ. You do not have Christ. And if you do not have Christ, as I've said, you're lost. If you haven't done that, and you recognize where you're at, we can make that different today. By doing those things, you can put on Christ today. If you are a Christian, if you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, but you recognize that you have not been living the way that Jesus wants you to live, this is a good time for you to redirect your life, put it back on track. Give your life to Jesus once more. Confess your sins to the Lord. He's faithful and just to forgive you. Repent and start walking in a manner that is worthy of Jesus. So if you have any need this morning, won't you come while we stand in the percent?